people more intelligent about the kind of healthcare decisions they make, help them to understand how the body works, and and to ask better questions when they go to their their healthcare providers. So if we look at um, what medical the med medicine does, let me get rid of this thing up here. There we go. Um, medicine does some things very well. They do crisis intervention therapy. We probably have the best system in the world here in America for that. Um, I mean, if you're uh -huh. shot or you're in a car accident, you know, broken up in a car accident or you fall, fall off a ladder and break some bones, we got the best system in the world to take care of you. Um, they're really good at reconstructive surgery. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I, they can they can fix like come on in, good to see you, Patty. Thanks. You know, like for example, fixing a cleft palate. I mean, they've got that down to an art now. Um, you know, they, we even do we can even do face transplants now. So that's that's pretty amazing, and they're really good at treating tropical and third world diseases and treating things like you know venomous snake bites. So the, the, there's some really good things that they do well. However, um, what was it? this working now? supposed to happen. There we go. Um, however, there's many medical um, and treatment recommendations that have little scientific basis, and that's part of the problem. They offer poor outcomes. One of these is back surgery for chronic back pain. Another one would be aspirin for prevention of cardiovascular disease, and another one would be arthroscopic surgery for knee pain. Now these are things that I just ran across just just in the literature, just reading articles, and that's how actually how this talk came about is I found so many articles on things like this that I decided to put together a talk on it. Now, um, according to science author and professor of orthopedic surgery Ian Harris, uh, he said many operations performed for subjective complaints have not been tested against a placebo. Yet when tested against a placebo, these operations perform no better than the placebo and sometimes worse. Okay, and that came, that's a direct quote from his book, Surgery, the Ultimate Placebo, which I have at home. I got some of this, some of this talk out of there, a little bit of it. So let's look at surgery for lower back pain. This is an article I got out of Pain Medicine, September of 2018. So surgery for low back pain is considered the standard of care in medicine. Many of these invasive procedures are marketed and paid for without clinical trials demonstrating evidence of effectiveness. Because of the bias towards surgery, patients are getting a false impression of really how, how well the surgery works. So um, if you look at surgery for osteoarthritis of the knee, Studies of real surgery versus sham surgery for knee pain demonstrated similar findings to low back surgery. Sam, sham surgery was more effective than real surgery and there's no difference in outcomes after six months. So do anybody in here know what sham surgery is? Okay, that's where they cut the skin open and then just sew it right back up. Okay, that's what sham surgery is. They don't do anything. Okay, just cut it open. So the patient thinks that they got surgery, okay? Mm -hmm. But nothing happened, okay? So osteoarthritis, and, and this, this, this one was common procedures done in orthopedic surgery, is surgery for osteoarthritis of the knee. 
There's no evidence that it works. In fact, the evidence says it really doesn't. What were the results of a study that looked at real back surgery versus sham back surgery? Again, they just made an incision in the spine and sewed it up. In studies that investigated sham surgery versus real surgery, the proportion of improvement due to sham surgery was 73%. So 73% of the patients showed improvement just by just by cutting the skin and sewing it up, okay? So that was, would you say that's a placebo effect? Mm -hmm. Absolutely yeah. it is. The improvement in the sham surgery group was greater than the real surgery. The real surgery group showed no difference in pain at six months compared with the sham procedures. So, you know, if you go in, now, I will say this, there are times when low back surgery is necessary. I'm not going to say it's never necessary, but for diffuse lower back pain, I would never do it, okay? I mean, if you've been in an accident and you have like some fractures down there, you need to have that wired up. But um, but for just lower back pain, you'd be better off just asking for the sham surgery when you go in, okay? So... This article stated the following. This is, again, this is pain medicine, September 2018. The risk of surgery include anesthesia, permanent injury to the body, psychological stress, time, cost, uh, money cost, and productivity loss. Large numbers of patients are exposed to risky and possibly unnecessary procedures. And the current evidence does not support invasive procedures for chronic pain. So, um, you know, when you think of chronic pain, there's a, would you say that there is a cause for that? And it's not a surgery, usually not a surgery deficiency. Okay. The cause for chronic pain. Now let's look at verboplasty and you've heard of this. This is where you have this compression fracture. They put in a needle and they put in cement and pump it you know, pump the vertebra back up again and, and try and restore the height, okay? That's, I, you know, this, is, this has been, you know, well used for a long time, okay? Anybody in here ever heard of it? No. Verbal I've plastic? Heard of it. I mean, it's used all the Does time. Does it work? Well, that's what we're going to find out here. <laughs> okay. That's why it's part of the talk, okay? So, um, according to the lead author of a comparative sham study with vertebral plasty, Verboplasty appears to confer no benefit over placebo, but poses some risk. Okay, so how do they do the verboplasty placebo? They, they poke the patient with a needle to think there's something happening, but they don't do anything. Okay, so what's the risk? Mainly potential for leakage of cement around the nerves or onto the blood vessels causing nerve damage or an embolism. Okay, so that's what you see here is leakage of the, the uh, cement around the vertebra, which could definitely uh, settle on the nerve and cause, cause neuralgia, okay? So that's what, this is an MRI and that's what you're seeing there. That was the best picture I could get of that. So what is the effect of daily aspirin? on all cause mortality in the elderly. So have you ever heard that older people should take an aspirin a day? Mm -hmm. Okay, prevent heart attacks. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, this is out of the New England Journal of Medicine, September 2018, one of the most respected journals in the world, okay? This is a large study, 19,000 people over the age of 70. The trial wanted to investigate whether daily use of a baby aspirin would prolong the lifespan of older adults. Okay, don't you think that's necessary to know that? That's good to know that. Now, I have another talk called The Side Effects of Over-the-Counter Drugs, where we talk about just the side effects of aspirin, which aren't very good, by the way, long term. So the daily use of aspirin, according to this article, did not provide any benefit. Subjects taking the aspirin had an actual higher death rate 
than people taking the placebo. Cancer was the main contributor, especially GI cancer. Aspirin has been shown to influence various cellular and molecular pathways that are relevant to the initiation, progression, and spread of cancer. Now, how many people know that? Now, that's right out of an article, right out of the New England Journal of Medicine. You don't see this on TV on the commercials. <laughs> no. You don't see anything like this. But it, people should know this, which is why I do these talks, which is why there should be more people here. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so uh, a May 9, 2019 study from the Journal of the American Medical Association of Patients, take this is JMA, well, again, one of the most prestigious journals in the world, show the following. These are people taking aspirin, low-dose aspirin, for prevention of cardiovascular disease. An increase of intracranial bleeding by 37%. So, so that's a brain bleed, okay? That doesn't mean 37% of the people taking it got a brain bleed. It says the increase, though, if you looked at the percentage increase is 37%. An increase in intracerebral hemorrhage, 52%. You know, now, I'm just going to say this. I'm not, if you're in a lot of pain, you know, you hurt yourself and you're in a lot, of, I'm not against taking painkillers for that. That's what they're for, okay? What I'm against is a chronic use of them for things like this because they cause problems in the body. They cause health issues. I'm a health care provider. Okay, what does that mean? That means that I want to make my patients healthier. I want to elevate their level of health. I'm not a disease. Uh, I, I don't treat disease. I don't treat symptoms. I'm not a sickness. I don't give you sickness care. I produce health care. And that's why I don't like this kind of stuff, because it, it actually causes health issues. You know, taking them for something else. You take it for one thing, and you get another thing. Doesn't make any sense to me. It's good cholesterol lowering drugs. All right. Um, a comprehensive review. This is in the Open Journal of Endocrine and Metabolic Diseases, July 2013. So if you listen to my radio show, which I know you guys did, I did cover this article. There's no question that I covered that. A comprehensive review of all the medical literature for articles relating to cardiovascular set, say the following, statins do not work for the primary prevention of coronary heart disease. They don't work, okay? Um, in almost 80% of the total number of individuals, the LDL cholesterol was inversely associated with all-cause mortality and with statistical significance. Now, the LDL is what? It's cholesterol they tell you you need to lower. You need to get as low as possible. There is an inverse relationship. The lower, lower people got it, the higher the death rate. That's what this is saying. It's unbelievable. Okay? This came out of British Medical Journal. Again, one of the top journals in the world. Okay? And that was 2016. Not that long ago. So what do statin drugs do? They cause an increased risk of diabetes. And I have an article on that, which uh, uh, when you come in for your appointment, Carmen, we still have some copies of that, right? I think so. Yeah, she'll give you a copy of that if you're interested. That's one of the, one of the most recent studies on that. Um, they cause uh, increased risk of myopathy, which is muscle pain. Increased risk of intracerebral hemorrhage. Cause increased risk of lung disease. Cause increased risk of Parkinson's disease. Increased risk of cancer. Increased risk of cataracts. Increased risk of arterial calcification. All such major adverse clinical events have been reported so frequently that, they sh that they're saying they should warn people of this. The authorities should be warning people of this. Okay? So, um, why would... Uh, let's see if we can go back one. Okay. Why, would, why do you think 
that would cause a risk of, of Parkinson's disease? Anybody? Because about 12% of our brain is made of cholesterol. So you lower the cholesterol too much, you don't have enough for brain function. Really? Yeah, 12%. Our brain is basically a big ball of fat. Cholesterol's fat. So 12% of, that's why uh, I had a patient not too long ago came into me and she was losing her memory. She came as a functional medicine patient. I looked at the drugs she was taking. She was taking cholesterol medication. I said, you need to get off of that. There's a book written about that by a medical doctor who took it and lost his memory called Statin's Thief of Memory. You can have the book of the library. And so why do you think it causes a risk of cancer? Why do you think statins do that? Cholesterol is a major antioxidant. It functions as an antioxidant in the body. So when you lower that, you lower your antioxidant levels. That's one of the reasons. Now, I don't know why cataracts, um, and I'm not sure about arterial calcification, but I know I understand why these two for sure. So let's look at premering. Remember when all postmenopausal women used to get premering? Mm -hmm. This is back in the early 2000s, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, Premarin is made from the urine of pregnant horses. That's where they get the word. Pregnant mare urine, Premarin, okay? So um, uh, it's believed to prevent, it, at one time it was believed to prevent osteoporosis, improve, improve cholesterol, reduce cardiovascular risk, but no studies were done to show this. They just thought that, that it would do that, so they started giving it to women. There were no studies to show that. It was an estrogen replacement. Um, and they, they, did, they got it from pregnant horses. So they're giving this um, estrogen from a, a, a very large animal to women. I mean, you know, what could go wrong? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so Premarin was the most widely prescribed pharmaceutical of any kind. For, for years. Um, and they even understood, they didn't really even understand how it worked. Do they still prescribe that, I wonder? Some, yes. There is some prescription of Premarin, yes. It's not as wide as it used mm -hmm. to be. Um, high quality study in 2002 showed that Premarin increased the risks of heart attacks, stroke, blood clots, breast cancer endometrial cancer. So there's studies, uh, there, there were no studies demonstrating the superiority of horse estrogen over human estrogen. They didn't have any studies on it. And this study, I remember this when this study came out, I remember where I was and I was just stunned. I saw it on, on the news on TV and I mean half my female patients were on primer and I couldn't believe it. Now, let's look at adverse drug effects. Adverse drug events are associated with increased risk of disability, hospitalization, and mortality, and, and can result from the appropriate use of medication as well as the misuse. So there's a median prevalence rate for adverse drug events at 12.8% overall. So 12.8% of the population will experience an adverse event from what they take. 16% for elderly. Why do you think it goes up with older people? Any idea? Why do you think, why do you think older people have more drug events than younger people? Any ideas? Well, they're taking more prescription drugs than young people do. Yeah, most of them are. Yeah. yeah. But what do you think? Do you think... Uh, uh, an 80-year-old can detoxify, their liver's working well enough to detoxify as well as like a 40-year-old? Yeah. No. No. So they can't detoxify these drugs as easily. Because, you know, when you take a pharmaceutical, your body doesn't go, oh, finally. You know, finally they gave me Lipitor. You know, 
No, it looks at it and goes, what's that? And it sends it to the liver to detoxify and get rid of it. That's how your body handles pharmaceuticals. Well, when you're older, you can't detoxify nearly as well because your liver isn't working as well. Your detoxification mechanisms are not working nearly as good. That's why it goes up for people that are older. Um, analgesics or painkillers are among the, the drug classes most often associated with adverse drug events. Do you know um, uh, how the United States compares to the rest of the world in the amount of painkillers we take? Any ideas? Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We take 80% of all the painkillers in the world in the United States. 80%. Okay, that's a lot. That is. You know, it seems like nobody be in any pain here. <laughs> you know, with all the painkillers we take. So, this is again, this is JMA study showed that opioids um, were, are no more effective than um, NASIDs and cause more side effects. Now, how long have opioids been around? Anybody know? Mm -hmm. They were approved by the FDA like 1995, 1996. And they're just doing a study in 2018. Now, you see how ridiculous this is? Why didn't they do a study before they approved opioids? that showed that they were no more effective than, you know, Tylenol or aspirin. So let's look at the adverse effects of opioid therapy. Depression, sexual dysfunction, myocardial infarction, addiction, risk of death due to overdose. You know, so um, can you imagine if these were the side effects of chiropractic care? Think anybody would go? I think we even have a profession? Absolutely not. Don't they do something to your breathing too? Does it slow it down? It like could, it yeah. It, actually, you're right. It, it no. does slow, you're exactly right. That's how people die from this. It slows down the cardiorespiratory mechanism to where people just stop breathing. That's exactly right. Yeah, good call. So, there's a large study in New Hampshire. They looked at insurance claims and they looked at the following. 59% of all patients prescribed opioids had lower back pain. It's almost 60%, okay? Chiropractic care reduced adverse drug events by 51%. So if they went to a chiropractor, instead of taking opioids, the reduction of adverse drug events was reduced by 51%. Now, how does chiropractic care compare when do, compared directly with pharmaceuticals? This is a very famous study. It was done in the journal Spine, which is the most authoritative orthopedic journal in the world. And they looked at um, nine weeks of pharmaceuticals, nine weeks of acupuncture, Nine weeks of chiropractic. This is a study, took 115 chronic back and neck pain patients and divided them into three groups. Now, with chiropractic care, they had, they they had 8.3 adjustments average, just not even one adjustment a week. Over nine weeks, they had 27.3% um, were asymptomatic in nine weeks, compared to drugs, 5%, okay? Percent that suffered an adverse effect. Drugs, 6.1% of the people that took them had an adverse effect. Acupuncture and chiropractic, no adverse effects. Okay. Now, when they, when they asked these people, they had them fill out a questionnaire in terms of improvement in general health status. 47% of the people under chiropractic care felt that their health had actually improved. Drugs, 18%. Acupuncture, 15%. Again, this is in um, the journal Spine. This was in 2003. It's a very, very famous, well-known study. It should have been on, t you know, this is the kind of stuff they had to put on the commercials on TV. But how many have ever heard of this study? Nobody. Nobody's ever heard of it, okay? What about deaths due to medical error? A 1993 study 
from Harvard reported the incidence of iatrogenic deaths at 180,000 per year. Um, iatrogenic is physician-induced. A 2004 report of inpatient deaths associated with the agency uh, for healthcare quality and research patient safety indicated in the Medicare population that 195,000 deaths per year due to medical error. That's okay. a lot. It's a lot of people. Yeah, wow. it's a lot of people. Okay. So, a 2011 study published in the Journal of Health Affairs shows that adverse events in hospitals may be 10 times greater than previously measured, over 400,000 deaths a year. That was 2011. Uh, and this is the Journal of Health Affairs, 2011. Uh, this is the British Medical Journal, 2016. Of note, the studies that captured deaths outside inpatient care those resulting from errors in care at home, nursing homes, and outpatient care, such as ambulatory surgery centers. None of the studies captured the events at, this, at, at facilities like this. There's only hospitals. So we don't know what it would be if you looked at this. So there's, and, and the reason for that, it, it's, it's not that, that physicians are bad people or they're, I mean, they're smart, hardworking, sincere people. The problem is, is that a lot of medical care is dangerous. I mean, it's just, it, there's a lot of risk involved. That's part of the issue. Okay, this is medical error is the third biggest cause of death in the U.S. and therefore requires greater attention. Again, British Medical Journal. 2016. Now, here's another one that I want to go over real quick. It's called the non-therapy of watchful waiting after a mild traumatic brain injury or concussion. The primary, primary medical uh, strategy for concussion was let's wait and see what happens. It's a terrible, terrible strategy. Okay, If you look at the literature, if you look at facts, regarding mild traumatic brain injury. It's 3.8 million per year. Concussion is one of the least in, understood injuries facing sports medicine. Um, acceleration, deceleration of the head and neck complex is of sufficient magnitude to cause a, a mild traumatic brain injury is also likely to cause concurrent injury to the joints and soft tissue of the cervical spine. So what they're saying here, if somebody gets a concussion, it's going to injure their neck as bad as in a whiplash injury, basically. Um, it's been known since 2006 that brain injured athletes concurrently injured the cervical spine. Injury or dysfunction of the cervical spine has been shown to cause headaches, dizziness, loss of balance, nausea, visual and auditory disturbances, reduced cognitive dysfunction. Same thing as you get in a concussion and many other signs and symptoms. So injury due to the brain can also um, cause the following physiological processes. So when you injure your brain, what you do is you decrease the ATP or energy production of the nerve cells in the brain. And you also reduce blood flow to the brain which is secondary to autonomic nervous system dysfunction, which controls blood supply to the brain. So um, therapies to speed up the healing process of a mild TBI, chiropractic care to correct the cervical spine, low level laser increases ATP to the brain. We have lots of, of uh, really great research on that. Specific nutritional supplements to assist with brain healing. Coconut oil. Okay, why is that? The brain's made of fat. Okay, alpha lipoic acid, N acetylcysteine, um, whey protein, acetyl L carnitine are all good for that. Magnesium and omega 3 fatty acids. These are things that help the brain heal when you have a concussion. There's no such thing as a pharmaceutical that I know of that I've ever heard of that actually helps the brain heal.
The brain is made of fat primarily, and it needs those kinds of things to help it heal. So is coconut oil a capsule or? No, coconut oil is just, you buy it and you can scoop it out. Yeah, we put it, I put it in my coffee every day. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. yeah, you can buy big jars of it at organic coconut oil yeah. at Costco. Oh. And yeah, I, we use it for everything. Put it in our coffee, we use it for cooking, cooking? Oh. everything. Yeah, we use it all the time. Yeah. Yeah, my, my wife's from the Philippines, so, you know, she feels right at home when she uses it. <laughs> they grow a lot of coconuts in the Philippines. Okay, what about chemotherapeutic drugs? So this is chemotherapy. An October 2017 expose in the British Medical Journal said that over 50% of the cancer drugs approved between 2009 and 2013 were completely worthless. Despite that, they continue to be used. Okay, this is, this is another article I covered on my radio show, did a whole show on that, I think. Um, Ian Harris, MD, says the following regarding chemotherapy. Chemotherapy can provide marginal survival benefits in patients with solid tumors, such as breast cancer. The same goes for radiotherapy. However, both are limited by their toxicity to the bone marrow. That's a pretty astounding statement, I think. Now, I got that out of the book, um, Surgery, the Ultimate Placebo. That's where that quote came out of. This is a, a 2019 JAMA study uh, about cancer drugs. And I, this is one I covered on my radio show. This is a, I, I was stunned when I read this article. Chemotherapy given in the 1990s was ineffective and toxic. That's what the article said. You know, in the 1990s, I was practicing in Hastings, and I knew people on chemotherapy, and they thought, I mean, back then, they thought, this is the best, this is, this is the cutting edge of science. And that's what they said about that drugs in this article. It says, today's chemotherapy drugs have the following side effects. Dementia, osteoporosis, and autoimmune disorders. Now, am I saying that nobody should ever have chemotherapy? I'm not saying that. But, you know, this is what the journals are saying. This is what the stuff you'll never hear anywhere else. So there are many more examples I could give. There's a book that I would recommend called Undoctored by William Davis. That is a great book. It's been a while since I've read it. Um, it's probably been out, probably came out in 2018, 2019, right around there. And I read it. Great book. There's a lot of good stuff in that book. I'd recommend that. That's highly recommended reading. So what do you plan to do? Do you plan to be proactive or reactive? And one of the questions I ask people, what's a, your basic model of health care? And this is another one of my talks. So do you have a, is your healthcare strategy where you wait for the next um, major, you know, your, your next major health breakdown, your next crisis, or are you proactive where you try and, and keep yourself healthy? You know, um, uh, one, of the, one of the strategies of a lot of people in, in terms of their lifetime care and the way they take care of themselves is they go from crisis to crisis. You know, that's not what I want to do, you know, and I'd hope that's not what you guys want to do. Um, do you blindly choose to trust invasive and possibly dangerous medical therapies? Well, you know, um, we're kind of taught to do that almost from when the time we're little, but it's not, it's not a good strategy. You know, that's why my, my strategy is chiropractic and functional medicine first. Let's try that first. Then pharmaceuticals, okay? Then if all else fails, then you do the surgery. But you don't do surgery first. I have a, let me tell you a story. I have a, a route, and I'm gonna let you go because I'm already five minutes over, but I have a, a close relative uh, who has a son uh, who his son uh, was, was at Princeton University, 
great baseball player, was going to get drafted in the pro as a pro athlete and, and look like, and he was very, very good. And he hurt his back. And so um, uh, instead of taking him to somebody like a chiropractor, where do you think they took him? They took him to an orthopedic surgeon. What did the orthopedic surgeon do? Back surgery. You think he's playing baseball now? No, he's not. Not playing baseball. You know, so uh, it, it, yeah, I mean, it, it basically torched his career. So I, I'm, again, I'm not saying you should never have back surgery under any conditions. I'm not saying that at all. But man, do that as a last resort. If all else fails, that's when you do it. Okay. So uh, uh, that's basically what I have for you tonight. And I, I would hope that tonight, tonight's talk, I've given you some information where you can make better healthcare decisions. What do you think questions. about all these pain clinics they got? Um, I think that uh, a lot of the stuff they're doing there is some of the stuff probably needs to be done on some people. Okay? But a lot of people are they're getting their symptoms covered up and there's other things that they could be doing instead. Again, I'm not saying that every person there, I mean, if you've been in a, a really bad accident and you have chronic pain and there's nothing that helps it, you need that. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Doctors are real quick to send you there now though. Yeah, they are. Treating you. And, and sometimes, you, you know, again, chiropractic and functional medicine is, it's what I recommend first, okay? You can always go to the pain clinic. You can always go there and get their, get what they give you. But it's not what I would recommend first at all. Mm. Not at all. Okay, any other question? Good. Well, thanks for coming tonight. I appreciate it. Hope you got Thank something you. out of this. Yeah, I did. And uh, what's our next talk? It's on the thing over there. It's... Uh, Oh yeah, how toxic we're gonna to do a talk on toxicity. How toxicity affects our health. Where do we where do the toxins come from? And how does it how does how does it work in our body and how can we get rid of it? So that's what we're gonna do next. And that's the seventh of the sorry, that's next next, next Tuesday. Yeah. Okay. Great. We'd love to see all of you here. Yeah. Thank you.